Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. As you know, this, this lecture is a memorial lecture for Andy and then for Krishnan, who was a former member of the it's Board of the Friends of the Rocket Library. Um, so we're very pleased to, to see such a, a large crowd here. <coughs> for those of you who didn't know him, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about him. Um, he was born in India raised there and educated there um, up to his undergraduate. But once he graduated, he um, left India and emigrated to the US. And it was there that he completed the rest of his education, getting a master's and a PhD in chemical engineering. During his career, he worked at uh, Marshall Labs at DuPont and at uh, Lucite International and proved himself to be a very accomplished chemist during that time. Um, so that by the time he retired in 2008, he had several patents to his name. And in fact, he was one of a, a team of three who um, created the Silverstone Teflon that is now used worldwide. So to my knowledge, this is the first time that we have had a memorial lecture. Um, we wanted to acknowledge Andy's you know, significant scientific career, but, but also to just say a little more personally about him. Um, he was an exceptionally warm and friendly individual. Um, he, he really lit up a room when he, when he walked in. Um, we were so delighted to have him as a, a member of the board and he was so enthusiastic about everything that um, he participated in and just threw himself into all of the, the work that there was to be done as a, as a board member. Um, in fact, one of our members described him as, as one of those larger than life people who made a positive impression on everyone that he met. So we really do miss him very much. We'll uh, be donating science-related materials to the library in Andy's name. And if anyone would like to make a financial contribution to that effort, um, I'd be happy to, to talk to you after this evening, or you can go and donate through the, the library's website. Just put Andy's name in the comment box, please. So tonight's lecture is being co-sponsored by the Science for the Public. We introduced Dr. Primack, um, who is Professor of Biology at Boston University. So over the past 10 years, Dr. Primack and his colleagues have been uh, using the journals of Henry David Thoreau to determine the impact of a warming climate on the ecology of Concord and the surrounding communities of Massachusetts. So his talk tonight is entitled Impacts of Climate Change on the Birds and Plants of Massachusetts. Dr. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, um, so 10 years ago, I was working on uh, the latest edition of my textbook in the field of conservation biology. And the, the section on climate change had gone from a very speculative section in 1992 that climate change might be happening, there might be examples of climate change in the world, to the point where 
in 2002, when I was working on the third edition of the Essentials of Conservation Biology, that that section had expanded into a subchapter, and it was threatening even to be a chapter of the book. But what was striking is that there were no examples from the eastern United States. So we had no examples from anywhere, anywhere in New England, no examples from really anywhere in the eastern United States, except for a few small, very, very, uh, not very well developed examples. And if you remember back to 2002, that's when George Bush was president. Uh, he was very skeptical of climate change, said that it was a theory, that the government didn't have to do anything about it until the scientists had decided whether it was a reality or not. And so I decided in 2002 that I would completely change my research direction. So prior to that, I'd been going off um, every year to Southeast Asia, looking at the impacts of logging on forests in Malaysian Borneo. And I decided that in 2002, I would completely change my work and to see if I could see the effects of climate change from really anywhere in New England or Massachusetts. And it seemed to me that you didn't have to go off to places like the Arctic or northern uh, Alaska to see the effects of climate change on things like polar bears. You didn't have to go off to the Swiss Alps and, and look in the mountains there, or you didn't have to go to Costa Rica. That you should just, if climate change was a reality, you should just be able to go out of your door in Arlington or in Boston or Concord or wherever, and you should be able to see the effects of climate change. And so this is really the story of, of our work, is what we found over the last 10 years of looking. And it turns out that if you are going to look for climate change, we were incredibly lucky. We didn't realize it at the time. We completely lucked out because there's almost no place in the country which has had as much warming as the metropolitan Boston area. So the metropolitan Boston area, as you all know, for those of you who are native New Englanders, we have famously variable weather, but the trend is toward warming. We've had about two degrees increase in temperature over the last 150 years. And this is a graph showing April temperature. And the reason I show April temperature is that a lot of our spring <coughs> phenomenon are very sensitive to temperature, and they're particularly sensitive to April temperature. And you can see in the 1850s, when Thoreau was active in Concord, that the temperatures uh, in the month of April are around two degrees centigrade. So that's about roughly about 36 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see we have warm years and cold years, but on the, tr on the overall, the trend is toward warming temperatures. And if you look up here, and we don't have a pointer here, so I have to kind of reach up there. So we had 2010, which people thought was the warmest year you would ever see in New England. We would never see a, a winter like or a spring like that again. And then 2012, the most recent year, actually was just as warm as 2010. So we have two record years um, in three years. So extremely variable, but in general, a trend toward warming. But this warming is not just caused by global warming. Out of this 2 degrees centigrade, about one third of it is caused by global warming. So the whole United States has increased by about 0.6 degrees centigrade, or about 1 degree Fahrenheit. But the other 2 thirds of the warming is caused by the urban heat island effect. So as Boston has developed as a city with more roads and parking lots and buildings and fewer trees, that there has been a warming associated with urbanization. So Boston, it turns out, is a great model system. The metropolitan Boston area, including Arlington, is part of this sort of warming trend, which is caused by both urbanization and global warming. So it's a great place to study warming temperatures impacts on biological systems because uh, it's, it's a model system. It, the metropolitan Boston area has warmed as much over the last 150 years as the rest of the country is predicted to warm in the coming 100 years. So it's a great model system for studying the effects of climate change. It also has great weather records. So these are weather records from the Blue Hills Observatory. So we had some very simple questions to address in our research. The first question is, what is happening? What are the impacts of this warming temperatures on the plants and animals and the environment of the metropolitan Boston area. And why should we care about that? So I think many of you in the audience know about it, but I'll just go through it very briefly. We should care about it because, I mean, we're interested in the impacts on biological systems, so things like flowering times of plants or the abundance of plants. But we're interested in it because if warming temperatures are affecting biological systems, it's going to drive endangered plants 
endangered plants and animals to extinction. It's going to have really negative consequences. It's going to cause forest trees to die, and that might affect the water quality, the soil properties of Massachusetts. Uh, it's going to cause street trees to start dying, plantings to start dying. It's going to affect agriculture. It's going to result in the increased spread of mosquitoes and ticks, which can transfer disease. And it's also the warming temperatures are going to cause the polar ice caps to melt and the glaciers to melt. And it's going to cause massive flooding in Massachusetts. So the biological effects that we're looking for by themselves may be not so striking, maybe not having direct impact on us, but the, they're indicators of things which are going to have tremendous impact on human society in coming decades. And then the next question is, what are we going to do about this? So if we can detect the effects of climate change in Massachusetts, you know, what can we do about it? And I think that we'll talk more about this later, maybe during the question and answer period, but there are things which we can do as a society to reduce our production of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases, and there are things that we can do as individuals in terms of reducing our individual impact. And of course, in a place like Arlington, there are things that you can do at the town level as well. So of all of the impacts that we can see of the effects of warming temperature, the two indicators that we have for which we have the most information are first of all phenology. Phenology is the timing of biological events and it turns out that timing is exquisitely sensitive to temperature particularly in the spring and particularly the flowering time of plants. And then the second biological indicator is the distribution and abundance of species. So there are some species, particularly birds for example, which can migrate in response to warming temperature, migrate up uh, mountains. And also there are many species which can change their abundance depending on temperature. If conditions become more favorable to them or less favorable to them, they can increase or decrease in abundance. And so this is what we are looking for. So our goal beginning in 2003, once we'd formulated this project, was to go out and to look for whatever records we could find. So myself and my graduate students, particularly one of my graduate students named Abe Miller Rushing and I, just started to go to libraries and looking for old records. We started to go to the New England Botanical Club and the Nuthall Ornithological Society and all the little funny old clubs that the Boston area has more than any other city as far as I know in the United States. We have all these little old clubs. So we would go there and we'd ask people if they knew about old records or long-term studies. We would go to libraries at universities or town halls. We would post notices uh, in libraries and supermarkets and wildflower kiosks asking people if they knew about old records. And people started to tell us about different kinds of records. And of all the old records that we came across, the records that were the best that we ever found and that we found pretty quickly were records kept by Henry David Thoreau in the 1850s. So he lived at Walden Pond in the 1840s, but beginning in 1851, Thoreau began to keep very detailed diaries of when plants were flowering and other biological phenomenon. So Thoreau, and also Thoreau makes, not only was Thoreau a great naturalist in terms of recording this material, but he's also very quotable and very recognizable. So Thoreau says, I want to go away soon and live away by the pond, but my friends ask what I will do when I get there. Will it not be employment enough to watch the progress of the seasons? So Thoreau was very interested in seeing how things changed over the course of the year, and also how different years varied in terms of how the climate or the weather in one particular year caused changes from a more typical pattern. But beginning particularly in 1851, he started to record all kinds of natural history information in his journals, and then started to extract it in tables. So this is, of course, is a replica of Thoreau. I'm holding some lilac flowers in front of a replica of his cabin on the edge of Walden Pond. So, after, several months after we began our project, uh, someone told us that Thoreau had these journals, that he actually had these tables, unpublished tables, and that an independent Thoreau scholar named Brad Dean in New Hampshire had copies of these tables. We wrote to Brad Dean asking him for these uh, tables. We actually we wrote to him and then called him. And what he said was very interesting. He said that these records that Thoreau kept in the 1850s are extremely important, are going to be extremely important for climate change research. And he knew that someday someone would call him and ask for them. <laughs> so here I was, you know, after several years calling up Brad Dean. Uh, several days later, he sent us photocopies of all of these tables. And 
And this is a, an example of one of his tables on the right. So Thoreau had notoriously bad handwriting. He started off recording things in common names. And then during the 1850s, as he got more familiar with plants, he started using scientific names. Many of his names are different from the present names. So he had all these multiple problems because he was using different names bad handwriting, antiquated names. And so it took us actually several years to get figure out all of his names and put them into an Excel spreadsheet and then match them with our own observations. So for example, he writes S. alba. You can see the red al arrow there. So S. alba we know is Spirea alba, so which is the plant shown on left, which is also called meadow sweet. And again, Thoreau is very quotable. One has as much as he can do to observe how flowers successively unfold. So not only Thoreau was, was the greatest observer that we know about in New England in terms of keeping these records in the 19th century, but by being so well known, he creates a lot of attention to this issue of climate change. So beginning in 2004, um, Abe Miller Rushing and I went out in Concord with lots of BU undergraduates. And we did the same thing that Thoreau did. We would walk around Concord uh, several days of the week. And we would look for the first open flowers of different plant species, such as Rodor on the left or the bird's foot violet on the right. And we would record the first, the day we found the first open flower in the warmest spot that we could find um, in Concord. And then we would record that date. So we did this for, we've been doing this since, from, since 2000 and for, for hundreds of different wildflower species. Uh, I should also say that this was a very popular activity for undergraduates, that most undergraduates, as you can imagine, wind up doing very boring things for professors. But they like the idea of walking around in Concord and then going to the Bedford Farms uh, dairy store afterwards for ice cream. So this was a very, very favorite activity for the students. And this is a summary of some of our results. And this is actually. Actually, this, this is a figure that's just going to be published um, on Wednesday. So this has actually not been published yet, but this is going to be published tomorrow. And I think it's going to be published in the Globe also. So this is a figure uh, which shows the observations made by Thoreau, another botanist named Alfred Hosmer uh, from 1888 to 1902, and then our own observations uh, starting in 2004. So each one of these symbols here represents a the sum of 32 common wildflower species that Thoreau saw in every year, Hosmer saw in every year, and we saw in every year. So things like the common blue violet, or the highbush blueberry, or the marsh marigold. And so on the, on the x-axis, we have the, the years from 1850 to the present time. On the y-axis, we have the dates in the spring. And you can see here that there's a progressively earlier flowering time from Thoreau's time to the present time. And so in Thoreau's years, there's a lot of variation. But on average, the plants are flowering around May 14th in Thoreau's time for these 32 common wildflower species that he saw in every year. And in Hosmer's time, a lot of variation in flowering time. But on average, the plants are flowering around May 10th. And then in our years, you can see the plants are flowering around May 4th. So it's about a 10-day shift in flowering time from Thoreau's time to the present time. And we published uh, our preliminary results a couple of years ago. and was covered in the New York Times. It was pretty dramatic, about a 10-day shift in the flowering time. But then if you look at this value right here, so this is 2010. It's kind of off the charts early. So an extraordinarily warm year results in a dramatically earlier flowering time. And we thought we would never see a year like that again. And then 2011 was a very early year, but not as early. But then 2012 is, again, kind of just off the charts unbelievably early. So this is just showing the dramatic change in the response of the plant community to this warming temperatures, to these record warm temperatures. So what's controlling the flowering time? Well, the overwhelming control of flowering time is spring temperature. So these plants are not responding to light or humidity or cloud cover or changing land use. They are responding almost exclusively to temperature. So on this axis here, we have the temperatures, the average temperature in March, April, and May. And this is the same data, but instead of presenting in terms of changes over time, it's changes in relationship to temperature. And you can see when it's a very cold year, so we have a very cold spring, but particularly in Thoreau's time, that the plants flowered very late in May. And that as the temperatures get increasingly warm, we have 
we have earlier flowering time. So these extremely cold, warm years, like the recent years, are the plants are flowering very, very early. So they're flowering in April. And so this graph is, is actually set up to tell a very interesting story. This line here is the, the best fit to all the points ex that happened before 2010. And this line tells you where we would predict that plants would flower if the temperatures keep getting warmer and warmer. And this historical data, which includes Thoreau's observation, tells us that if the temperatures get to be about 11 degrees, that we would see them flowering here at the end of April. And these sort of bars here represent sort of the, the estimated interval that we would see that, predict, that prediction. And so this is the value for 2012, 2010. These are the actual values. And you can see that their kind of estimated range of when the prediction would be sort of captures this line right here. What that tells us is this historical data gathered by Thoreau and Hosmer and then ourselves before 2009 sort of accurately predicts when plants would flower under extreme warm conditions like we had in 2010 and 2012. For scientifically, this is also very interesting because it tells us that plants are just keep, are keep responding to this ever-warming condition by flowering earlier. There's no sign that these plants have stopped responding to warming temperature. There are some scientists that say that once it gets warmer than a certain point, the plants won't respond that they just will not be capable of responding to the warming temperature. They'll stop flowering earlier. Maybe they'll even flower later. Maybe they'll even die. We haven't reached that point yet. Our plants are still capable of responding, but eventually there will be a limit where they either don't flower any earlier or they just start dying. But we haven't reached that point yet. And this, we've also, one of the things which is very interesting about uh, this paper that we have coming out is that we've heard that it was an incredibly early year for the researchers who had been following the work of Aldo Leopold, the very famous environmentalist in Wisconsin, that Aldo Leopold made observations in the 1930s and the 1940s um, at his shack in Sand County. And it turns out that 2000 and 12 was also a record early year for flowering time in Wisconsin. It's kind of an off-the-charts early time for flowering there. And again, the historical data predicts fairly well when plants flower in Wisconsin. So this is really part of the story. So it's not just this extraordinary warm year and early flowering in, in Massachusetts. It's also happening in Wisconsin. It's happening really at other locations that we know about in the United States. So. There are actually some interesting consequences this, of this environmentally. So if plants respond to average temperatures by flowering earlier and by leafing out earlier, one consequence of this is that plants might be extremely vulnerable not only to uh, just heat stress and dying because of that of drought, but they also become very susceptible to frost because unusual frost events still keep occurring regardless of the average temperature. So plants might be stimulated to flower earlier leaf out earlier, and then those young leaves and flowers will be killed by hard frost. And we actually had an example of this in 2012, if you remember. So we had a very mild winter, very mild spring. Plants started flowering and leafing out early. And then we had a hard frost uh, in the first week of April, this last spring. And this is a picture of, of, of azaleas right here. So azaleas were, azalea flowers were killed by this frost at the Arnold Arboretum. Uh, so we're constantly looking for new ways to tell the story of climate change. So Thoreau is one great way, but another way we found to tell the story of climate change is using museum specimens. So at the Arnold Arboretum, they actually have, in addition to all the wonderful live plants that they have at the Arnold Arboretum, they also have a museum collection of over 100,000 museum specimens that have been collected on the grounds of the Arboretum over the last 120 years. These are called herbarium specimens, and this is an example of a herbarium specimen. And so what we did is we started to go to the Arnold Arboretum and record when plants are presently flowering at the Arnold Arboretum, and then matching that up with when plants flowered in the past using these museum specimens. So this is a museum specimen of a plant called Rhododendron Vasei. So this is plant number 20,953. And this is a herbarium specimen collected on May 19th, 1938 from this exact same plant. So some botanist came along and took a cutting from this plant in 1938. And this is the, this is the preserved specimen. And this 
specimen here is in exactly the same stage as this plant in full flower on May 3rd, 2010. So in 2010, it was flowering two weeks earlier than it did um, in 1938. And if we went back and we took a photograph of this plant on May 19th, 2010, or in 2012, there would be no flowers on it. It would be completely past flowering, and it would be fully leafed out. So using these kinds of museum specimens and matching them with current observations, we can again tell the story of climate change. Another source of information is photographs. So this is just sort of one example of, of a photograph which can be used to tell the story of climate change. So Abe Miller Rushing and I were giving a talk once and we met a woman um, at, who came up to us after our talk and she told us that she was very interested in our talk and she had an unusual hobby. She liked to collect stereoscopic photographs of from historically important cemeteries on Memorial Day. So a very specialized hobby. And she said that of all the pictures that she had from New England that were taken on Memorial Day, there was one photograph that was really strange and we would like to take a look at it. And she showed us this one. This is actually one of the stereoscopic pairs. And so this photograph was taken at the Lowell Cemetery on May 30th, 1868. And if you think about it, May 30th, there's something strange about the photograph. So what's strange about it? No leaves, that's right, no leaves, and also the people are wearing very heavy clothing. Uh, and so it turns out that 1868 was one of the so-called years with no spring. It was, a, it was a year in which there were uh, repeated hard frosts all during March, April, May, and even into June. So the plants either didn't leaf out by this time or they might have left, started to leaf out and the leaves were killed by the frost. And this picture on the right is exactly the same shot. We have the stairs here, the stairs there. Um, at, at, at the Lowell Cemetery. And you can again see that by May 22nd, even a week before Memorial Day, the plants are already fully leafed out. Another interesting twist to the story is that almost every one of the trees that you can see in this photograph are actually still alive, you know, 150 years later. And all leafed out. Um, so we've increasingly gotten interested in leafing out data. So for several years, for actually a half a dozen years, um, we were just very focused on flowering time, and it was, there's just so much flowering time, there's so much flowering data out there that we were just captivated by this. But now we realize that there's a lot of information out there on leafing out time. And leafing out time is actually economically more important because leafing out time ties into all the things like absorbing of carbon dioxide and uh, the production of timber and uh, leaf production. So we have started to realize that there's a lot of leafing out data, and it turns out that Thoreau also recorded the leafing out time of several dozen common tree and shrub species in Concord during the 1850s. And so if you look at spring temperature during Thoreau's time, it was much colder than today, so 1854, 55, and 1860. And you can see those are the values. So in Thoreau's time, the plants were leafing out, the common trees and shrubs in Concord we're leafing out uh, in early May. And in 2009 and 2011, these same species are now leafing out at the end of May. And that 2010 and 2012, these species are leafing out in the middle of May. So a huge shift in the leafing out time of plants um, in Concord in response to warming temperatures. One interesting kind of note is that the warming, the earlier seasons, result in a changing perception of historical events. So in this year on April 18th, uh, the Memorial Day celebrations, excuse me, the, the Patriots Day celebration at Minuteman National Historical Site, the thing which was interesting about it was that all the trees were leafing out and flowering. And so this is your sort of perception of what that event is. It's kind of a spring event of, of Patriots Day. But in fact, this is historically not accurate. That historically, on April 18th, the plants wouldn't be flowering. They wouldn't be leafing out. We would still be in the middle of, of wintertime conditions. So, this is a point where I have to say something that as a native New Englander, I grew up in the Boston area and I, I sort of like the idea of earlier springs and milder winters, <laughs> but uh, at the same time, even though we might appreciate it in having milder winters, I mean, there really are a lot of negative consequences to it. So as, you know, as we, I mentioned in the beginning of my talk. Also, these changing conditions are going to tend to favor invasive species. So if you look at 
Uh, what happens, for example, when we have very warm conditions in the spring, what species are really able to take advantage of this? So this is a, a photograph that I took of the twigs of many of the common plant species in the Boston area during the very early spring of 2011. And the plants on the left here, which are all leafing out, are non-native invasive shrubs and trees. And the plants on the right, so this is, for example, Japanese barberry, um, Moro's honeysuckle, the multiflora rose, and the plants on the right are all non, are, they're all native species which are not yet leafing out. So what this tells us is that the non-native invasive species are really taking advantage of the changing climate to leaf out earlier and also to hold their leaves longer in the autumn. So one of the reasons why these non-native species are so successful is because they can expand their growing season and grow faster in contrast to these very conservative native species. We're also trying to connect our research with experimental work. So some of you may know that on Beaver Street in Waltham, there's a very unusual structure uh, near the old state laboratory near Bentley College. And there's a group there that is uh, from the University of Massachusetts at Boston, which has created this experimental setup to simulate the effects of a warming climate using heaters. So all these structures right along here are heaters, which are heating different plots to different temperatures two, four, and six degrees centigrade above the normal temperature. Uh, above here, all these tubes here are putting down different amounts of rainfall to simulate different scenarios of how rainfall might be changing in New England. And so we've been working with this group this is also just to give you an example of, of how this looks in the winter time. So these plots right here in the front right here are control plots that don't have any change in temperature. But these plots back here and here are ones where there have been increased temperatures from those heaters and they've melted the snow and they've warmed the ground. And using these kinds of experimental setups, we can again see that sort of warming temperature sort of increases or changes the timing of biological events. And then all for certain plants, it winds up stimulating their growth. So they wind up growing faster as a result of these warming conditions. But actually, other plants are harmed by the warming temperatures. <laughs> Another new direction that we're taking in our research is looking at senescence of leaves in the autumn and also of autumn events. So autumn events have been comparatively not very well studied by Thoreau and by other naturalists since then. And we have tended to ignore the, the autumn. But one thing which we're starting to do very actively now is to look for autumn data to see sort of how the milder conditions in the months of September and October and November might be causing plants to keep their leaves longer in the autumn, cause migratory birds to delay their migration, uh, causing insects to not die off as early, to go into their diapause a little bit later. So it's something we think it would be very interesting to study. We think there should be data out there, and we're just starting to look for it now. We've also been making very intensive attempts to locate bird data to see how climate change is affecting the migration time of birds, particularly when birds arrive in the spring. So we, first we want to know, are birds responding to spring? Are they responding to temperature or other factors? Um, and also we want to know, if, is their response similar to that we've seen with plants? So we know that plants are responding very strongly to temperature. Are birds responding in a similar way? This is a picture, by the way, from the Manamet Bird Observatory, the Manamet Center for Conservation Science um, in Manamet, right next to Plymouth, Massachusetts. Well, there are certain uh, examples that you can find about birds that are responding very strongly to temperature, very changing quite dramatically over time. And one example is the wood duck. So there is a woman named Betty Anderson who lives in uh, Middleborough, Massachusetts, in the South Shore. And since the 1950s, Betty Anderson has been recording when she sees the first wood duck on the pond outside of her farmhouse and recording it in her journals. And you can see that, that when she first started working in the 18th, in the 1970s, not the 1870s, the 1970s, that uh, the birds, were, the wood ducks were arriving on her pond in April. And then over time, it's quite variable. But in general, they've been shifting toward earlier, earlier arrival time. So they now arrive in early March or even late February. And this is actually related to the fact that wood ducks probably arrive even earlier but they kind of hang out in the woods and they're waiting for the pond to, the pond outside of her uh, house to thaw. 
And so this is really, it's a record of when she sees the first duck, but it's actually really a, a record of when the pond thaws. And we know that ponds are, are thawing earlier. So we found that there's an extraordinary abundance of bird data. So when Abe Miller Rushing and I started looking for bird data in 2003, um, we just kept finding more and more and more bird data. And eventually we stopped looking for bird data because there, there, it turns out that there are so many birding groups, so many ornithological clubs in Massachusetts, so many people keeping diaries of birds, and there's so much historical information about birds that we actually just stopped because there's just so much great data out there. And these are just examples of four of the studies that we've done. And you can see that one of them is from Concord. So initially Thoreau recorded when common migratory birds arrived in Concord. And these were continued on by other people into the present time. So we actually met a woman named Rosie Corey who from the eight, from the 19 50s to the present time, so over a 60 year period, has been recording when birds arrive in Concord in the spring. So incredible amounts of data that are available. And all these studies of birds tell us the same thing. They all tell us that birds are arriving a little bit earlier in warmer years and colder years, and they're arriving a little bit earlier over time than they did in the 1850s. So birds, instead of arriving instead of changing dramatically like the plants, they're changing very slowly. So they're arriving now a couple of days earlier than, than, they, with, than they did in Thoreau's time. And the reason that birds are not responding as rapidly as plants, we think, is because, first of all, they're coming from far away where their conditions don't exactly mirror the conditions here. Also, birds don't fly in response to only to warm conditions. Birds don't fly in rainy weather. They don't fly when there's a headwind. So they're responding to a lot more complicated factors than just temperature, whereas plants are responding almost exclusively to temperature. The missing link in, in our research so far is insects. So when the birds arrive in the spring, they are eating insects mostly. And when the insects emerge in the spring, they're mostly eating plants. So we know what birds are doing. We know what plants are doing. And really, it's the insects which are the connecting link. And for many years, my students and I searched for insect data. We thought there had to be data out there, of, you know, beekeepers or people who are interested in dragonflies or somebody must have information about what insects were doing. We thought at one point that people studying tiger beetles, there was all this people very enthusiastic about tiger beetles, it would be tiger beetle data, but we didn't find it. And for years we just, we kept asking people and, and contacting every group we could think of and we couldn't find any insect data. And then finally, someone suggested that we study butterflies and then in particular, we studied two groups of butterflies called elfins and hair streaks. And it turns out that elfins and hair streaks are great species to study climate change because they have only a very short flight time. They come out, elfins come out in the spring, and hair streaks come out in the summer. They come out very briefly. They're often quite common for about two or three weeks, and then they die. So very, very good species for climate change research because they appear to be very, they come out very suddenly and have a very short lifetime in contrast to most other butterflies which have a much longer season. So we began to investigate hair streaks and elfins using data provided by the Massachusetts Butterfly Club and also historical records kept in places like the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. And what we found using these records was that in fact, these elephants and hair streaks were, are now appearing much earlier than they did in the 1970s and 80s. So they're clearly shifting when they're arriving and the, when they are appearing in the spring. And they're also very responsive to temperature. They come out earlier in warm years and much later in cold years. So very similar to the birds. And so this is kind of a summary of some of the things that I've talked about so far. So this is a graph from the PhD thesis of my one of my graduate students, Catherine Polgar, who finished her thesis last month in a very exciting uh, event. And this is from her thesis. And on the, X, on the Y axis here, we have a graph showing how many days earlier an event happens for every one degree increase in temperature. And these events are all below the zero line, meaning that these are all happening earlier be because of warming conditions. And so we start off with the plants here. So we know that plants are flowering about three days earlier for every one degree increase in temperature, that um, the 
Plants are leafing out quite strongly with warming conditions. You can see that birds here, for example, are not responding. So they, have ver they are responding a little bit to temperature, but only to a much less degree than the plants. And that the butterflies that I just mentioned are, just, are, are responding just about like the, the plants. And then also, just a couple, about a year ago, a study came out about native bees in New England, showing that native bees are also responding very strongly to temperature. So we have these two insect groups and lots of plants. And so what this tells us is that the, the birds are not really responding as much as all the other aspects of the system. And this sets up the potential for what we call an ecological mismatch. If the birds are arriving, if they've always arrived in the past to catch a certain pulse of insects to feed themselves and also to feed their nestlings, and suddenly they're arriving later and all the plants are flowering earlier and leafing out earlier and the insects are active earlier, they may miss those peaks of abundance of insects and they may not have as much food for themselves and for their nestlings, and they may starve or their nestlings might starve. So this is something that ecologists are thinking a lot about and are writing a lot about, but there's actually surprisingly little hard information about it. It's really more speculative at this point. So Thoreau was very aware of these ecological interactions. And I was really just kind of stunned when I came across this quote reading his journals. He said, insects and the smaller animals follow vegetation. The greater or less abundance of food determines migrations. If the buds are deceived and suffer from frost, then are the birds. I mean, this is kind of mind-boggling. This was 160 years ago, and Thoreau wrote this simple statement which summarizes absolutely cutting-edge thinking on the effects of climatic variation on the interactions between plants, insects, and birds. Especially he's talking about if the buds are deceived by frost. So, I mean, if, if the buds are deceived and if I get this right, if the buds are deceived and suffer from frost. So he's talking about the same thing that I was mentioning earlier about it's warm, if the buds start opening and then there's a hard frost and the buds are killed, then there won't be any leaves and flowers, and so not as much food for the, the insects and the birds. So he's just talking about this exact same phenomenon 160 years ago from, you know, from his own observations. It's just, it's just totally amazing. Also, I want to mention something that whenever you do field studies, like we've been doing for the last 10 years, you always see something unexpected. And the thing which was quite unexpected for us is that as we went out into Concord, trying to record the flowering time of every plant species, that we found that there were, in fact, many of the species that Thoreau observed, we couldn't find, that we couldn't find the flowering time of them because they just didn't seem to exist anymore in Concord. And eventually we began to intensively search for all of the species that we couldn't find, that Thoreau had observed in Concord and that we couldn't find. And after many years of searching, we came to the conclusion that approximately 27% of the species, about a quarter of the species that Thoreau observed in Concord during the 1850s were no longer there. Uh, that about 36% of the species that he saw are now rare, meaning they only occur in one or two populations. This loss is very surprising because about two-thirds of Concord, as you may know from going out there, is, it remains undeveloped. About one-third of Concord is, is protected landscape. It is conservation land owned by the federal government, it's owned by the state government or the town or by land trust. So it's a well-protected landscape. Another one-third of it is in private hands, but still protected in some way or undeveloped. So you would think that there would be plenty of places for these rare species to live, but or these wildflower species of Concord to live, but in fact they either are not there or they become quite rare. Also, most of the loss of species appears to have been in the last 40 to 50 years. And we know this because there was a very detailed flora of Concord done in the, 18, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And the author of that, named Richard Eaton, does not describe these species as being extinct. He, des he describes these species as still being present in Concord, and yet we couldn't find them. And so the loss seems to be very recent. So what could be causing this? As an example of the loss of species are the orchids. So in Thoreau's time, there were 21 species of native orchids in Concord growing in the wild, and we've only been able to find seven of them. So two-thirds of the orchids, the native orchids in Concord, are now appear to be extinct. And one example of a species that we record as being there is the purple-fringed orchid. 
We saw one purple fringed orchid in one year. And we went to that same spot the next year. We couldn't find it. But we recorded it as being present in Concord because during our 10 years, we saw one plant in one year. So that's one of the examples of the species which is still there. So tremendous loss of certain groups of species. So beginning four years ago, we began to collaborate. Abe Miller Rushing, who actually is shown right here, who's my uh, colleague in much of this work, began to collaborate with three Harvard colleagues shown in these uh, circles here. And this is actually kind of a graphical representation of an, an analysis that they propose that we do. So the analysis that they propose we do is to take all of our flowering time data from Concord from these hundreds of species, combine this with all the change in abundance of species, which species have gotten more common or less common or stayed the same, and then also using an evolutionary tree to include as part of the analysis. Because you'd expect that similar species would have similar characteristics just because they're closely related. So we have Thoreau in the center. These are all the species in Concord for which we have data. And the groups shown in red are groups that in which the rate of loss of species is more than you would predict by chance. These species are declining more than you would predict by chance. And so here we have members of the aster family, the lily family, the orchid family. And these are families in which there's been a lot of decline of species. So what's causing this decline? It turns out when you do this analysis that species are not being lost at random. So of course related species are being lost as groups like the lit, like the orchids. But also we found was that the responsiveness to temperature was also an explanatory factor. So the species that f were very responsive to temperature, meaning they flowered very early in warm years and late in cold years, tended to have stable populations or even increasing in abundance. And species which always flowered the same time, they had very rigid phenology, very rigid timing of flowering and leafing out, regardless of the temperature, were the species which were tending to decline and go extinct. So this tells us that the ability to respond to a changing climate is a secret to success. So this means, that what we also found was that the warming temperature tends to favor invasive species. So these invasive species tend to have very flexible flowering times and they can respond to the changing climate by flowering early, leafing out early, and doing much better in that environment. Also, southern species are doing. Species which are at their northern range, the northern edge of their range in Concord, are increasing in abundance. But cold-loving northern species that are at their southern range of distribution in Concord are the ones that are tending to decline. So this is an amazing result. This result tells us that climate change is not just affecting the timing of flowering in Concord right now, of timing of wildflowers, but it's also affecting the abundance of species in Concord right now. It's already determining which species are winners and losers in Concord right now. The species that are being lost are the species which are not able to handle the warming conditions of Concord. It also tells us something very interesting, which is that if we want to bring back these species, these lost northern species, these species that Thoreau saw. If we want to recreate Thoreau's garden, for example, we want to recreate the wildflowers that he saw in his walks around the Estabrook Woods, we can't do it because the environment is now too warm for these northern species. And then, in fact, we really, if we want to restore the same number of wildflower species that were present in Concord 150 years, we really have to be choosing southern species which are not even present in Concord today. So just summarizing a few sort of points. So when we began this study about 10 years ago, there were no examples of climate change from anywhere in New England. There was not a single example of how warming temperatures were affecting the plants and animals of Massachusetts. But now I can identify very strongly with this quote of Thoreau's. He said, we cannot see anything until we are possessed with the idea of it. Take it into our heads, and then we can hardly see anything in it, anything else. So when I walk around Concord today, and I go to places like the Estabrook Woods, or Minuteman National Historical Site, or Walden Pond, all I can see is climate change. I can see the effects of warming temperature on the plants and the animals of Massachusetts. I can just see how it's affecting the flowering time and the abundance of certain species, the loss of species. And actually, 
If you want to go out and demonstrate to yourself the effects of climate change, just any one of you this coming weekend, go out to Walden Pond. I was out at Walden Pond a week ago, but it wasn't frozen. The middle of January in Walden Pond, which was typically one to two feet thick in Thoreau's time was not even frozen a week ago. And after the temperatures we've had over the last couple of days, I think that probably it, the majority of the pond will be open water during the middle of January, which is something which is just Thoreau would have been totally amazed by. So this is, you can just see yourself the effects of climate change just by seeing Walden Pond. So what we've been doing is we've been connecting our approach with researchers in other places. And it turns out that this approach of looking for historical data and connecting it with current observations is a very fruitful approach. And we've been working with colleagues in Japan, on cherry blossom times, in South Korea, in Philadelphia, a very, another very historical city with a lot of information, um, Acadia National Park and other places, and we find that every place we look, there is this historical data, and it can be used to tell the story of climate change. So it isn't just Boston, it's really just any place which is experiencing warming temperatures, which is most places in the world. So many of you kind of, if you've kind of been inspired by my talk at all, you might kind of think about, you know, how can you get involved in this? Well, there are actually a lot of ways to get involved in it. So we actually have volunteers helping us at places like the Arnold Arboretum. Um, and so if, if you want to get involved with it, you're certainly welcome to help us at the Arnold Arboretum, monitoring the flowering time and the leafing out of plants. We use volunteers at other sites as well. But one easy way to do it is also there are these national networks in which people can contribute biological observations, particularly of when things happen in the spring, like when birds migrate, when plants flower or leaf out, or the abundance of species. And three of the most well-known of these networks are eBird for birds by, out of Cornell University, also the National Phenology Network, and another one is called Project Budburst. So these are all fairly new networks, but they're very well developed. And uh, these are very good, if you want to get involved in making observations relating to climate change, these are three very good places to start. So a few conclusions. So I think I've hopefully I've convinced you that spring is happening earlier in Boston. So you know, again, we started 10 years ago. There was no evidence for it. But now Massachusetts, or I should say the metropolitan Boston area, is the most well-documented place in the United States for the effects of climate change as a result of work that we've done and that other colleagues have started to do in the Massachusetts area. Um, there's a lot of data out there, and we haven't even analyzed all the data that we found. More changes are coming. Um, one thing which I would recommend all of you to do is start keeping a diary that over the next five or 10 or 20 years, and certainly over the next half century, there are going to be great changes occurring um, in the metropolitan Boston area. And if you start keeping a diary now of just whatever you see around your house or you go in your walks, this information is going to be very valuable. Um, I mean, you could kind of wish you started it five years ago or 10 years ago, but just start it now. Start recording when the apple tree flowers in your front yard or, or the forsythia start flowering. And you'll find that you have an interesting set of records even over just a few years. I mean, just if you think about the last three years, they've been amazing years. And if you just recorded that data, you would have already had something pretty amazing. Interactions are probably changing. So we think that birds are being particularly negatively harmed by warming temperatures because of their lack of connection to insects and plants. But we really don't know. And this is a very active area of research. Um, I've been talking about climate the whole time. And I think that for those of you who are naturalists know that there are a lot of other factors which affect the abundance of plants and animals and even the timing of events. And I'm aware of these, so all the things like habitat destruction and fragmentation, acid rain, uh, invasive species, deer, lots of things are affecting biological systems. But the thing which is very striking is that climate change is the one which we knew the least about and seems to, will probably have the most profound effect on our ecosystems. Because it means that whatever we protect will probably not succeed in the future because of warming temperatures. So climate change is one which we really need to investigate. But there are a lot of other factors which affect biological systems. A lot more work is needed on things like insects, the effects of climate change on insects, on leafing out time and leaf senescence. 
Uh, we need to know how species are responding genetically and evolutionarily to temperatures. Can they adapt over time or will they just die out? And we also need to understand how invasive species are responding to these warming temperatures and other changes in the environment. So one of the things which has impressed me in Concord is how management is very important in protecting species. So if you actually go to Concord, the places where you see the most rare species in Concord are in places like the Minuteman National Historical Site, where a lot of the trees have been cleared along the river. Concord has plenty of trees, but it doesn't have really enough open landscapes, places like river meadows or open fields. And these places where people have deliberately tried to create a more mixed type of landscape are places where you really see a lot of the, the rare wildflowers and butterflies, um, amphibians, and things like that. And so we really need to manage the landscape in addition to climate change, but to create the habitats that many species need. We also need to start thinking about what biologists call assisted colonization. So the wildflowers are declining in Concord. The number of wildflowers are declining in Concord. If we want to maintain the same number of wildflowers that Thoreau observed, we need to start thinking about going to places like southern Connecticut and New Jersey or even Virginia and start collecting wildflowers from there and bring them to places like Massachusetts, like Concord or Arlington, and start planting them because these southern species are the only ones, where these, or mid-Atlantic species, are the, really the ones which are going to be able to tolerate the warming climates. And we need to very carefully select species which are not going to be invasive, but these are species which were just moving one or two or three hundred miles north of their existing range into the same kind of ecosystem, but we need to do this in anticipation of a warming climate. So, one of the things that I also believe is that the public really needs to get involved in the issue of climate change and that scientists need to get involved. So one of the things that, that our group is very actively involved in is public outreach. We spend a lot of time talking to groups like you all or writing popular articles. Um, and certainly all of you need to get involved. I think that probably a lot of you are aware of the issues of climate change. Probably a lot of you are involved in it already. But the American public is very weary of, of a lot of things on its mind. I mean, issues of the economy. Uh, wars, um, problems with education, problems with the healthcare system, and that a lot of people think that you know climate change is just not a priority. But climate change is a priority. It is something which is important. I mean, not to say we should do that and nothing else. We have a lot of issues in American society. But certainly, it's something that particularly people with a scientific interest or an interest in the environment you know, really need to make as a personal priority and also to try to get the society to change so that the society itself, the, whole, the American the United States as a country also takes this to be more of a priority. Um, and with that, I close and thank you very much for your attention. Do you know if it's harmful to uh, run a wood stove or have a fireplace in the city or anywhere? Um, does it contribute to global warming. And also, is it true that you have to run a fireplace or a wood stove is less environmentally harming, harmful than to run an electric space heat? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not an, an energy expert, but certainly, um, I mean, if you're burning a wood stove, you're releasing all that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. But again, maybe we have an, an energy engineer in here, but I think that it's probably somewhat comparable to, to burning oil. The one issue is certainly in urban areas is if you're burning a wood stove, you're kind of creating a lot of particulate matter, which if people do this kind of at a widespread scale, really contributes to sort of uh, air pollution within the urban environment. Hi, thank you. Um, have you um, been able to or attempted to include other species of animals in your study, like amphibians or marine mammals, or reptiles? Well, we're constantly looking for new data sets. Um, so people keep telling me, for example, that there's data out there about when fish migrate up streams and rivers, when the sort of spawning takes place of things like alewives. But I've actually never seen the data. So it might be there, but we haven't sort of found it. Um, there, are, there are actually lots of studies of when 
frogs start calling in the spring. Uh, we've actually only found fairly limited data like that from Massachusetts, but there actually are other places um, in New England and New York where people, particularly for spring peepers, the people. Yes, yeah, so I mean there is that kind of stuff, but you know it's it's we haven't found very much of it, and certainly you know the the, the frogs like spring peepers are sort of responding to temperature though. Um, okay, sure. Thank you. This is not so much a question, but you were talking about society. Can you talk loudly, please? Yes. Uh, it's, it's not so much a question, but you were talking about society being more aware of global uh, climate change and how that interacts with the economy. I recently come upon a group called CASSE, Center for the Advancement of Steady State Economy. Uh -huh. And those people are responsible for a book called Enough is Enough. And uh, you can go on their website, and they're very connected uh, uh, educationally uh, and worldwide mm -hmm. to uh, start to make some changes to deal with these issues. Well, certainly, I mean, a lot of organizations that are involved in this, so certainly one of the most well-known people involved in this is Bill McKibben, who often has spoken in the Boston area and written a lot about this subject. So he has a, describes an agenda that people can get involved in. But of course, one thing we also have to be aware of is the fact that there are also these kind of, kind of uh, non-believers in climate change or sort of people who are opposed to climate change who are often setting up websites and organizations which appear to be scientific organizations but really are, are kind of non-science organizations which are trying to discredit uh, the issue of climate change. Yeah, this book deals with all that. Okay. <coughs> I'll try to speak loud. Um, how do you keep up? today's information, one, and um, suppose we all work hard together in USA and do the right things as far as trying to, you know, conserve, but other countries are not doing that. Well, that's right. I think that, that that actions on climate change really have to be taken at multiple levels. So we certainly have to, I think we can take actions as individuals and certainly Thoreau is a great advocate of you know, taking personal responsibility in terms of, I mean, his, his ideas from the 1850s are still, or 1850s are still very relevant today in terms of living simply, you know, having a small residence, living a modest lifestyle, eating very modestly, uh, having uh, kind of very modest clothing. So these are all kind of things that he was talking about 160 years ago, which are still very relevant, not only as a personal statement of living frugally, but also very relevant to climate change. And I mean, these actions can be taken at the city and the state level, even while the federal government is not as active, but we can continue to put pressure on you know, our federal government, but then ultimately we need to get our government involved in, in international issues. So I mean, the United States, China, and a few other big countries are really kind of dragging their feet on this issue. And you know, we, need to get, we need to put pressure on our government and our representatives so that there will be international cooperation. Because you're right, even if we t took strong action in the United States and nothing was done about this in countries like China and India uh, or Russia, then you know, the effects would be not imp important because carbon dioxide circulates through the whole world. And also about sort of maintaining optimism. I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of, I just, I think an optimistic person by nature because I just see so much beauty in the natural world. So when I go for a walk in Concord, I mean, I'm not thinking, well, 25% of the species are lost. I just keep thinking about all the beautiful species that are there today. And actually keep being kind of feeling very lucky that I'm out walking appreciating all this beauty that I see. And when I go to the Arboretum, the Arnold Arboretum, there's like, you know, there's like, you know, several thousand species that are there for my enjoyment, or places like the Garden in the Woods. Or when I take trips around New England or outside of New England, there's just, there's so much beauty in the world. Some has been lost, but there's so much beauty remaining that, that it just makes me feel great every time I'm outside walking around. Okay. Um, yeah, what you mentioned about the assisted colonization ideas, that's giving me some great hope, and especially about I'm the worries about plants as the climate changes and plants that can move up mountains and then they get stuck mm -hmm. and they can't go anywhere. But with the assisted colonization idea, that's a possibility of helping these species out. Can you speak to anything that's going on in that vein? Well, right now in the scientific community, there's a huge discussion about assisted migration 
or sometimes called assisted migration. And there's so much discussion about this and surprisingly little work actually going on in this because scientists are very timid, landowners are very timid, so conservation or protect people who are managing national parks are, are very nervous about this idea about assisted migration. Um, so there's a whole discussion about it where people are arguing kind of the pros and the cons of it, but I think that, that we've had enough discussion about it and I think it's time to start trying it out. In fact, people have been trying out in a certain kind of funny way already. It's been pointed out because if you go to the places like, you know, garden centers, or particularly places like the New England Wildflower Society, Garden in the Woods, that they're selling all these southern wildflower species already, and people are growing them in their gardens. So it's very obvious to gardeners that you can actually grow a lot of southern species further north than you used to be able to do this. So, and if we choose species carefully, so if we choose endangered wildflowers that have no potential for being invasive, you know, there's really no reason not to do this. And we've actually talked about starting to do this in, in different places in Concord as kind of a model system uh, for doing this. And I think that that's something that which will probably happen within one or two years. Just kind of an anecdote about that. When I was growing up in Boston in the 1960s, that nobody grew fig trees. So people didn't grow fig trees because they just said, well, you can't grow fig trees in Boston. And the only people who grew fig trees were people who grew them in pots and they took them inside their house during the winter time and they put them in their cold basements. And you can actually grow fig trees outside in Boston with minimal protection right now. And we have an enormous fig tree in our backyard that we planted about 10 years ago, or really I should say my wife planted about 10 years ago. And we get a, more than 1,000 figs from this fig tree in, in, our, in our backyard every year. So it's just, this fig tree is just healthy as can be, and it's just prolifically producing figs. And that's just an example of something you couldn't do in the past. 40 or 50 years ago, 40 years ago, if you had planted a fig tree in your backyard, it would be killed by the frost. And now, with minimum protection, you can grow fig trees very easily in the Boston area. So that's an example of how a changing climate is allowing different species to live here. Okay? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Sure. Okay. Um, I just had a question about your data, the data that you're gathering from Concord, and I noticed it was Walden Pond and Estabrook Woods, and I forget the third one, but do you have data that tells you that in fact that these parcels are relatively intact um, in similar condition as they were in um, Thoreau's time, and the reason I ask is I'm from Boxborough, uh -huh. and Thoreau wrote extensively in his journals about Inches Woods in Boxborough, about the magnificent stand of white oaks, and that should Boxborough forever enjoy them, and short, a couple years later, I believe it was the Navy came and felled the whole bunch mm -hmm. to um, go to the war effort. So, uh, that parcel of land has definitely experienced a great change in mm -hmm. its ecosystem. Um, so, the original question, are you relatively right, yeah. certain that, that it's a somewhat um, constant environment to the no, no, actually, I'm, I'm certain of the other th situation, which is that it's not a constant environment. There have right. been, been enormous changes. So during Thoreau's time, that was right at the height of, of agriculture. Agriculture was just starting to decline and farms were being abandoned. Were, most of, during Thoreau's time, probably only about 10% of, of Concord was forested. It was mostly agricultural land. It was fields. Uh, and now it's mostly a forested environment and there's actually only about 10 or 20% of it is sort of open fields and uh, areas. So there are enormous changes which have occurred. There were no deer in Concord during Thoreau's time. Now there's a problem with deer. We have all these problems of acid rain. So many more roads than in Thoreau's time. So there have been huge changes. The, one of the things which is very interesting though is that, that the loss of wildflower species in Concord is has been, was the same for all of the different kinds of biological communities in Concord. So you would think that, for example, that in Thoreau's time, since only about 10% of the area was forested and now it's more than 50% forested, there would actually be a lot of woodland wildflowers, a lot of forest wildflowers. But in fact, 
the number, the, the percentage of wildflowers lost from the forest communities is the same as from all the other communities. So there's been a general loss of wildflowers in all the communities, regardless of whether they've increased in abundance or decreased in abundance. So there's a lot of factors which are changing in Concord, but when we actually do our analysis, we can actually see the signature of climate change in terms of which species respond to temperature and which species are increasing or declining in abundance. But huge changes in Concord over the last 150 years. Oh, I think we have one over there. Okay. On a business to Chicago, I was told that they are uh, planting trees that come from uh, further south now. Uh, in anticipation of a climate change in Chicago. Is there any regimented or organized uh, program through the tree wardens in the various communities in Massachusetts to do this sort of thing in this area? That's something I'm not sure about in, in Massachusetts, but certainly the, the U.S. Forest Service is very aware of changing temperatures and that they're already doing large scale uh, plantings of trees from different places sort of in anticipation of, of climate change. So certainly the, the warming temperatures, you know, is having an impact on what foresters do. And again, we can see this in terms of what people are planting in, in Massachusetts. So, for example, southern magnolias, people never planted southern magnolias in Massachusetts because the, the idea was that they get killed by the frost. And now southern magnolias are being planted in Massachusetts and they're doing fine. So just a few degrees warmer is changing what kinds of trees we can grow in this area. Okay, so uh, you're talking about gardening and plant selection. Couldn't we flip this thing upside down and couldn't people be creating colder microclimates to serve as refugia for some of the species that are still here so they can continue at least, you know, to a limited extent and not be completely extirpated by the changing climate. Well, I guess you could, I mean, there's certainly, within Concord, there are sort of warmer places and are colder places in Concord. We tend to focus on the warmer places because that's where plants flower early. Um, so there's a, one place in the Middlesex School that's kind of this uh, very, uh, very uh, fancy private school in Concord. And there's actually one place where you have these several buildings that are all sort of in a curve facing to the south with kind of a sand gravelly surface. It's like a big kind of oven. And so the plants just flower incredibly early in that one particular spot uh, in Concord. But there are also really cold places in Concord also. But the problem with the cold places is that in addition to being cold, they also tend to be very shady and have other sort of you know, peculiarities to them, uh, you know, not having the sun. So they're often not very good places for a lot of wildflowers. But you know, theoretically, one could find places like that also. Last question here formally. Okay. And okay. you can feel free to talk to him. He's losing his voice. Okay. <laughs> I have a two-part question. One is louder. Does that um, It's not a microphone. Oh, it's, nice. it's for recording. Oh, it's, it's recording. recording. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's two parts. That when you talk about how you, when you've done the studies, you've seen this dramatic decrease in the number of wildflowers, and um, isn't there some part of that that's natural attrition, and the reverse of that, and just through time and evolution, but and is and the opposite of that is, are you finding new ones? Is mm -hmm. it just only a decrease? Are there other ones that have come? That's right. Existing? So the question is um, whether isn't the loss of species a natural attrition um, and whether other species are coming into Concord. And what we see happening, actually, and this is not just in Concord, but this is actually, there have been many studies now in the Massachusetts area. So again, Massachusetts is probably the most well-documented place um, in the United States for sort of the continuity of wildflower populations because of all this historical effort made by botanists in Massachusetts, often associated with the New England Botanical Club and with Harvard University. And what you'd expect is that sort of over time that individual species might sort of die out, but that they would be replaced by other species from the neighboring towns, that there would be sort of a natural turnover of species, but the number of species would tend to be sort of steady over time. And what we're half seeing is that, that overall there's a decline over time in the number of species, wildflower species in Concord. So they are being lost and not being replaced, not being replaced as fast as they are being lost. 
Also, if we look at, there are actually a lot of species that have come into Concord since Thoreau's time that Thoreau didn't see and that other later botanists didn't see. And these new species that are coming in are almost exclusively non-native species. So they, they, these are species which are not native to Massachusetts. They are often European or Asian species. Many of them are escaped ornamentals that people have brought in and then they just spread from their garden into the woods. There are actually some cases of southern species that have arrived here. There's actually interesting, uh, there's a whole group of species that are found uh, in the coast of Massachusetts. So they're found um, in, in, in um, salt marshes and they're actually spreading along Route 2 because of the salting of the roads. So it's kind of an interesting group of species. But overall there's, a, there's this trend toward fewer species over time and a greater percentage of non-native species in the flora. Okay, so I think we're, Yvonne, so are we done? Okay.